Hi, everyone. Good afternoon. Welcome. We're going to get started. My name is Vitanella Rafael. I work as the program manager for ITRAC delegations to, Is to Israel for Israel & Co. I also currently sit as the chair of IAC Dol Chodesh, one of the young professional programs of the IAC. I'm happy to speak to you about both later on. Our IAC salon today um, is going to be a TED-style talk of think makers who exchange ideas um, and insights with their peers. Our speakers today are um, Jonathan Levav, Jen Delton, Ilana Golan, and Chloe Valdery. The way it's going to work is that each one will come present. They have a couple of videos, presentations, and then we will do Q&A um, at the end. So Jonathan is our first speaker. Jonathan serves on the faculty of Stanford Graduate School of Business. Um, he's the professor of marketing and has published numerous articles on the psychology of decision making and consumer behavior. Please welcome me. Please welcome, um, welcoming Jonathan. All right, this works. Can we turn down a little? Because I hear reverb. Yeah, better. Hear me? Yes. yes? Wonderful. Um, okay, so uh, this is not going to be a TED style talk. TED style talks, uh, you stand on a red dot. Um, people come away with some kind of, uh, you know, you present a question and then you come up with some kind of pithy line, a simple answer. Um, and today I'm going to present to you a bunch of things that are going to lead to more questions rather than answers because uh, they're at the very beginning of a program of research that I'm engaging in. Um, but, but, but before I go there, I'd be remiss um, if I didn't uh, take a moment to remember that uh, 22 years ago yesterday, um, a Jew assassinated a sitting prime minister in the state of Israel. Uh, and there's people in this room who, uh, when you ask them, where were you when Rabin was assassinated, they can't answer that question. Uh, and so for them, we have to make the choice to remember. And I know you guys came to hear about decision making, so this is my choice, um, is to remind you what happens when we let uh, violence uh, seep into our uh, uh, civic and political discourse. So I think this conference is about celebrating Israel, and um, we should also be grateful for the people that fought and lost their lives in the name of Israeli democracy. So I'll start with that, and then I'll get to social science. Uh, let's talk about technology and consumer behavior. I live in a part of the world in Palo Alto where we're really, really good about creating new things. We're, we're really good about making new technologies, solving all kinds of complicated problems. We know a lot less about what those technologies actually do to people. Um, and so since, since I moved to Stanford, I spent eight years at Columbia. Uh, since, since, since I moved to Stanford, I started trying to understand what is it that happens psychologically when we interact with technology. And so what I'm going to show you today um, are a series of findings. Um, a series of findings, as I said, are going to lead more to more questions than answers. Um, and so broadly speaking, the research approach here is to say that uh, technology affects psychological processes. And if you affect psychological processes, then you also affect people's uh, choices and judgments. And I'll show you a bunch of examples. They're related in the sense that they sort of follow this, they follow this idea. Um, and so this is my plan. I'm not going to get through all of it uh, because I have about 10 or 12 minutes. Um, but, if you, uh, but if we had the time, I would talk to you about it. Uh, I'll talk to you a little bit about technology, media to communication, so video conferencing. How many people here use video conferencing at work? Raise your hand. Wonderful, everybody. Um, how many people here buy things uh, on their electronic device? Raise your hand. Wonderful. So when you buy, can I borrow yours? Let me borrow this one. Okay, take that one. Yeah, yeah. No, I'm not going to write text from your phone. Um, <laughs> yeah, <please>. No, no. <laughs> So, uh, you know, the, the, these touch-enable devices are actually a physical experience. In addition to being something that we can take to bed with us, which we can't do with a computer, or take to other places, or carry around compactly, they're also a physical experience that involves swiping and clicking. And what I'm going to argue is that that physical experience actually changes uh, how people um, process information about the things they're swiping through. And finally, we're really for sure not going to get there. One of the other things um, that happens with technology is that technology introduces new kinds of physical motions to the way in which we make decisions. Um, and so those physical motions, just like when you count on your fingers, you ever count on your fingers? How many people here count on their fingers sometimes? Yeah, count on your fingers. 
that actually affects how you process information. The moment you affect how somebody processes information, you affect how they make decisions and judgments. All right, so let me show you some examples. One of the sort of uh, dominant dictums in Silicon Valley is that you have to have your engineers co-located in order to create new products. Ah, you gotta have everybody together, they have to be in the same room, um, you have to sit there and brainstorm with, with a whiteboard. There's this belief, but there's no empirical evidence for it. And so we decided to ask that question. And why, do we wanna, why is that question interesting? It's interesting because nowadays you have companies that develop products across different places in the globe. And so you have a team in Israel, and you have a team in India, and you have a team in Berlin, and you may have a team in New York, and you're based in Mountain View. Um, and do we have to be together? Or can we just rely on this technology? What does this technology do to the way in which we communicate, and how does that affect our decisions? Um, so let's think about how, how innovation happens. Innovation has two steps. First step, we have to generate ideas, right? That's the generative step. Second step, I have to decide which idea I want to pursue. Right? It's not enough. You know, you, when you come out of a brainstorming session, you typically come out with 20, 30, 40, 50 ideas. Right? But eventually, you can only invest in one or two or three because you have limited resources. You'd love to experiment with all of them, but you can't. Um, so, there's, so the second phase is selection. You have generation, and then you have evaluation. And so we ran a very simple experiment to see how these different phases would be affected by use of technology. We brought uh, pairs of people into lab. And, and we randomly assigned them to do the following task. They, we gave them a Frisbee, and we said, you have to come up with as many creative uses for this Frisbee as you can. It's a standard task from the, from the creativity literature. Incidentally, we've since replicated it with peanut butter. It turns out another standard task is how many things you can do with peanut butter. It turns out you can do a lot of things with peanut butter, a lot more than just put it on bread. Um, and, so, and so we bring in our Stanford undergrads, and, and that's what they do. And they do it in one of two ways. Uh, we either sit them in the same room, and basically, right, what you see there is a Google Doc, and they type in their ideas, and so we basically are able then to count how many ideas they're producing. Or we send them to adjacent rooms, and they look at each other through a screen. Should this make a difference? Should it make a difference? Not does it, should it. Think about if we interact with each other. If you saw me through a screen right now, or you see me standing right in front of you, it doesn't really matter because the text is the same, the person is the same, the audio vision, I mean, it's the same, should be. Um, so, so what we believe is that there shouldn't be a difference here, and let's, what, what we study in this experiment is, is, is there a difference? And so basically we pay people the more they come up with ideas. And then we tell them, we give them five minutes, and then we tell them, look, pick the idea you think is best. And if an external panel of judges thinks that that was indeed your best idea out of the ideas that you uh, came up with, we're gonna give you a, uh, five times the payment. Okay, so there's, so there's stakes involved. They can make as much as $200. My dean at Stanford is very generous with me. Um, and, so, and so I get to spend quite a bit of money, and this was one of the studies. Um, and so what happens? Well, the first thing we did is we counted. Okay, how many ideas did people in each different condition come up with? Um, and it turns out that indeed, as your intuition suggests, people came up with more ideas when they were together versus when they were looking at each other through a video screen. Um, but here's where it gets interesting. And by the way, their ideas were also, they generated a few more novel ideas as well. So, so we rate these ideas for novelty and usability. That's kind of our composite measure. I'll be with you in a second. You, you have a clarification question? Go ahead. How were you able to quantify the difference between each individual? How can I quant? I literally count. Yeah, yeah, because they enter, they basically enter each idea in a line in this Google Doc. So if they enter 10 ideas, I count 10. If they enter 12 lines, I count 12. It's very simple. So this is, this is what the intuition suggests would happen, but where things get really interesting is actually um, in the idea selection phase. It turns out that people come up with fewer ideas in the video phase, in, in the tech-mediated communication condition, um, but they decide worse. Okay. They decide worse. So the way to read this graph is closer to zero is better because what I'm graphing here is the discrepancy between the rating of the option that you, of the idea that you submitted versus your best idea. So if your best idea was an eight and you submitted the idea that was rated a seven, you get a one. That's how it's scored. And so together we came up with more ideas, but apart we made better decisions. Okay, so think, think, think about what that means uh, for, for uh, distributed teams and, and, and global companies that can have a massive effect. And so many Israeli companies actually have two offices. And, 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 um, 
and they have the split of where decisions are made and where, and where um, product development decisions are made. So the question then becomes, why is this happening? And the answer is, this is where I, this is where I go non-TED, um, which is I have absolutely no idea, but I have some hypotheses um, that we're testing now in the laboratory. Uh, the first possibility is that uh, it, it relates to this specific finding, which is that when we look at each other through a screen, um, even though I'm looking at Stuart through the screen and I still see Stuart, right? That's your name? Yeah, I got it. Um, I'm <laughs> looking at Stuart through a screen, it's still, it's still him, there still is a sense of psychological distance, right? It's like, you know, the, the distance of the people that live in the upstairs apartment is much shorter a lot of times than the people that live down the hall, but it feels much more distant because psychologically it's further away. What happens when we feel psychologically further away? It's easier for us to criticize. How many people here have sent an email that they would have never said in person, they would never said what they said in an email to that person? Everybody, everybody who's not raising their hand is just too, too, too shy to admit it. We all go nasty on email, and part of it is because of, that, because of that distance. That criticism is damaging when you're trying to just come up with ideas, but, it, but it's helpful when you have to figure out which one to go after. Another possibility is a physical one, which is that when I'm trying to come up with creative output, um, I do engage in something called divergent thinking. So I'm, I'm, I'm sitting across from my father-in-law, Kenny, this is my father-in-law, Kenny, right here. I'm pointing at him with a laser. Um, and, and we're talking about how to come up with uses for a Frisbee, and we're in this room, and you know, I, we're kind of wander. And let's say I wander to his jacket, or I wander to the light over there, and I say, oh, light Frisbee. You start connecting things that come from lots of different elements in your environment. So that's helpful to come up with ideas. In contrast, when I'm looking at Kenny through a screen, um, I, I have to necessarily sort of peel away the world that's around me, and I'm just looking at everything through this box. And so, and so um, what that does is that what we're looking, we're testing now is whether that inhibits your ability to think more uh, fruitfully, to, to, to engage in more fruitful divergent thinking. And on the other hand, looking at Kenny through a box may be useful because it focuses me, right? And so this decision requires quite a bit of cognitive focus because you have to weigh the different possibilities and basically make something of an educated guess of what somebody else is gonna think is your best idea. Okay, so, so, so that's what we think is happening, but we're not sure. Um, uh, we're exploring it now, and now we're gonna, actually we have a company that's willing to let us run uh, this experiment on their engineers, so we're actually gonna do it for real money uh, in India next month. So I'll have some in a report next year if I'm allowed back. Um, so that's, that's communication. I'm good on time? I'm close on time. Okay, let me show you something else quickly and then I'll close. Um, can I? So we have these devices and we see these devices as facilitating our lives. In what way? Well, I can do, I can make commercial transactions quickly. I can sit in this lecture and buy stuff on Amazon if I want. Um, I can walk down the street and I can uh, buy an air ticket. Okay, so we see this as, as a form of distribution of information of, of, of disseminating commerce. But what I want to argue is that this is not just um, a facilitative device, it's also a type of physical interaction. We all like to do this, right? Or this one is my favorite. I could do this all day long. You know, open and close, open and come on. You know, everybody loves this. Old people, young people, just sit there and just, it's extremely pleasant. Um, one of the genius elements of this, of this device is that it's actually really pleasant to touch. Okay, now what happens psychologically when, when you're engaging in a pleasant task like this, is we know that people focus on information that's congruent with the pleasantness that they're experiencing. Let's think how that would make a difference to how we would make a choice. <coughs> you're getting a text, um, so I have to go back to you. Um, how, how, <laughs> how that would make a difference to the kind of product that we choose. Products have different kinds of attributes. Some attributes are about the functionality of the product. Think about your car, right? Your car has an engine, it makes it go. That gives you uh, utility, it gives you sort of psychological value because, because the car moves, right? Because you need to get places. Uh, but products also have hedonic components, right? So your car might be really attractive because it's red, right? Those are things, for instance, that, that, that relate to aesthetics. Those are things that make us feel good. And so what we do in this set of experiments is we have people configure products. What does that mean? Is that they put together the product, they customize a product, and these products have both hedonic dimensions, the ones that relate to pleasure, and utilitarian dimensions, the ones that relate to functionality. 
Um, so this is one of the many studies that we've run. We had uh, students in, in a university in Switzerland configure a bicycle. And what we did is we got an iPad, like this one here, let me borrow for a second, on this iPad, and we either made it touch, it was either touch enabled, so you use it as you would ordinarily use it, or, we, or you had to use it with a mouse. So what you have is direct pleasant contact versus peripheral, what we call peripheral input, where you're clicking. It turns out clicking is not that pleasant. It's not unpleasant, right, it's not painful but it's not pleasant in the way that that sliding motion is pleasant. So we had people configure a bicycle, and it turns out that this bicycle has lots of different dimensions. It has dimensions that relate to like, the safety of the bike, like the brakes, and it has dimensions that relate to the, to, to the looks of the bike. Uh, and what happens? What we discovered is that people in the touch-enabled condition where you configured your product by direct contact with your hand, right, with this nice little swiping, um, people configured more expensive bicycles. And so I saw this result and I was like, wow, this is amazing for consulting practice. Like now every company that comes, I can charge them a lot of money just to tell them that, and, and it's golden. But of course science doesn't work that way and the question really is why? What accounts for that difference? And what accounts for that difference, it turns out, is that people in the condition where you actually used your fingers directly tended to upgrade more the hedonic features of the product. So you got the nicer kind of paint you got the nicer looking bicycle, right? In terms of the utilitarian dimension, there was no difference. It didn't matter to the kind of brakes that you got. So we've run a series of experiments on this, but, but, but what this suggests more generally is that, you know, beyond the implications for e-commerce, is that, is that there's an element, there's, there's a, the physical interaction with technology has, has an effect on how we process the information that that technology is feeding us. And even though we're very, very good at making screens um, and making apps, we have absolutely no clue yet um, exactly how using these things actually affects us. Um, and it can make things better and it can make things worse. We don't know. We're still in the nascent stages of trying to understand it. So it is, is flagging me that I have to be done. So I'm just going to do this. I'm going to show you that I had all kinds of things prepared so you believe me. Um, and, and I'll end with this last slide, and thank you very much. <laughs>
you could say that it really is whatever you decide it to be for yourself. But the challenge is, what is it for you? Am I telling you that you can't be yourself? That you have to fit a certain stereotype based on who's friends with you on Facebook or connected with you on LinkedIn? So when we think about professionalism, what does it look like? Well, I'm going to go through the social media channels just briefly to make sure we're all starting from the same place. When I think about Facebook, I think about the water cooler. It's where you share little gossipy tidbits, not in a bad way gossipy, it's just little bits of information. And a lot of people ask me, is that personal, professional, what if I'm connected with my boss on Facebook? What should I do? That's up to you, but I would err on the side of, uh, I'm very risk averse in that standpoint. So I won't have things on Facebook that are too personal. Then you look at channels like Instagram. Anybody have an Instagram account? Fun, beautiful pictures. You can take people with you on your journey every day. It's very dynamic. It's beautiful. How many people are brave enough to tweet? OK, that's good. It's like little bursts of news, right? Little bursts of news. It's a lot to manage. So they each serve their purpose. But for LinkedIn, what I think people have forgotten a little bit is that it's business. It's the boardroom. It's not a place for pol politics, religion, personal, angry messages. It is your chance to be a professional digitally, and by the way, in front of more than 500 million people. So when we think about the story you want to present, would you want to work with this person? you know who this person is? Right, they don't even have a picture. I don't even know who you are. I can't see the whites of your eyes. How can I trust you? So how many of you don't have a picture on LinkedIn? People aren't even going to connect with you. There's not a story there. It's like a fake person. Conversely, this is a note I got last week from someone that I just met. And she reached out to connect with me. And she said, hi, great meeting you last week. I loved the workshop. I'm already trying this out, et cetera, et cetera. Who would I rather work with? No person or the nice, friendly person that talks to me? Anybody? Person A? Person B. Yes, person B. So even though it is technology, you can still have a personality. You still want to build credibility and reach out and communicate. So for how many people that try to connect with me without ever saying how they met me or why they want to talk with me, that's a problem. Tell me why you want to connect. Give me some information, because that will increase your odds when you're reaching out to a company or reaching out to a recruiter to actually connect. It's not a numbers game. It's still people. We're just on different sides of the computer. So here's my question. What's the story you're presenting? Over time, does it change? Do you have an arc? LinkedIn is not a resume. It is your story. You get to have a narrative and pictures and words. It's your personal, professional website. So how are you managing your brand, your reputation? How are you showcasing your why? If I come to your profile, am I going to leave right away? Or do you give me information so that I know what to do with you? Yes, I want to hire you for this. Yes, you'd be great at collaboration. Or are people getting stuck? Do you know the attention span of a person? Anybody want to guess? Hmm? Yeah, nowadays. Anybody? Less than 10 seconds. That was 2012. That was a long time ago. Attention span now. What do you think? Oh, three seconds. Gosh, so cynical. Oh, we're around six seconds. So when someone comes to your profile, or even meets you in person, they're deciding like that whether they want to get to know you, if they want to move forward. So the question I'm going to have for you is, what's your evidence? Anyone here telepathic? No? Dang it. Telepathy is not a good strategy. When you're trying to help people understand what to do with you, it's not a good strategy. 
So how do you communicate, like Simon Sinek would say, your why? What's your purpose? Your what? How do you make a difference? People put stuff on LinkedIn, and a lot of times it's all of your activities. But that doesn't tell me anything about you. I don't know how you'd be on my team. I don't know what you care about. I don't know if you're empathetic. How? How do you work with companies, with teams, to make a difference? Personal branding is not personal bragging. I'm not telling you to go out there and tell the world you're the best thing since sliced bread. I'm asking you to be confident in your results and own them. It's very important to help people know you. Why? Why do I need to know you? So I can like you or not. Why do I need to like you? What has to happen next? I have to like you in order to what? If I'm gonna do business with you, what needs to be there? Trust, oh, A plus. Know, like, and trust. This is what you leverage LinkedIn for, or Facebook, or any channel. How do you increase people's knowledge of you? How do you get them to like you? And how do you get them to trust you? So even just having a profile photo, even having pictures or words that convey a story, that first impression, let's face it, we all have ADD, our attention span went from here to like here. So how do you hook people in with a great first impression with words that tell them what you do? Anybody here, are, are you your job title? No, right? You're not a job title, you're not a VP. I mean, you're literally a VP, but you're a person. So why would I want to communicate with you as a person? How do you have that show through? We can get evidence, like I talked about earlier, and a lot of people, students, people in their career, CEOs, miss this part. Tell me what you do. Tell me what organizations you belong to. Tell me your projects. If you don't tell me, who else is going to tell me? Anybody have their own CMO just for themselves? It's called you, right? You're your own CMO. Congratulations, you've all been promoted. You are now in the C-suite. And if you aren't, or if you are now, you have another title. Skills. This is the only sort of technical slide I'm going to hit on, really important, because people miss this all the time. Endorsements and skills. Anybody find these annoying? Here's what happens. If you don't manage these, LinkedIn will do it for you. So they'll present options to people, and people can say, yo, Click here, Chloe is great at this, Alana is good at this, Jen is great at this, Jonathan is good at this. They may not know that Chloe does not want to be a massage therapist. <laughs> they just know they like Chloe, they think they're gonna help her by clicking on this little word. A better thing to do, do you want to be a massage therapist? No. A better thing to do would be get a recommendation. We talked about telepathy is not a strategy. Go ask people to write recommendations for you. I would just ask you to draft it for them first. Then you send it to them on a normal email, not LinkedIn email, because that'll get stuck in the nether, the ether. Draft a recommendation and send it. And then the other thing is actually write recommendations for people. If you meet someone here and you loved their talk, or you met someone at a networking event, maybe at an event last night at the dinner, and you had a great conversation, think about how you can say thank you. If you're in a college course working on a joint group project, Write recommendations for each other. Build your evidence early, because I have lots of people 10 years in, they don't remember who they should reach out to, and that person may not remember them either. So think about recommendations. These are really important. So just like Google has algorithms, so does LinkedIn. Your skills have a very heavy weight on the algorithm. And if you have more than 12 recommendations, you move up in search. So I'm just sharing that because a lot of people don't know that, and it's important. So I'm gonna get back to the pretty slides in just a second. Some people don't do things on social media, especially LinkedIn, because they have no idea where to start. I call it the eyes that are not about you. Inform people. Share articles that you read. It does not have to be about you, and in fact, personal branding is generally not about you, it's about your audience. What do they wanna hear? How can you help them? You could influence. Maybe you wanna write an article to shift perspectives. Maybe you want to inspire. So these are easy ones, right? This was a talk I went to where I just wrote my own thought but tagged the person who spoke. 
I'm happy to give you information on how to do that outside of this. But how are you using it for others? Because the best way to build your brand is to recognize other people. Inspire, this was another talk I attended, amazing speaker, just shared her quote. Ironically, her quote was, find yourself and be that. The world will never see you higher than you see yourself. Pretty powerful stuff. Why do I share this with you? Because times have changed. 93% of recruiters, the first thing they do is Google you. They don't look at your resume other than to get your name to Google you, if you make it that far. They will be looking at your social media profiles, all of them, and if you haven't Googled yourself, you should. Be amazed what's actually public and you might think it's private. Let me just tell you, nothing's ever private. So if you're putting online, it's fair game. I'm just giving you that information. You get to decide what to do with that. Like I said, I'm very risk averse. You will never see me with alcohol or in a bikini ever, ever. So no like and trust. Earlier this summer, 10 Harvard students had their offers rescinded because of things they put on Facebook. Do you think that brought their trust factor down? They probably weren't even at the trust stage, right? A friend of mine knows of a grad student, got a job at Goldman Sachs, was in the middle actually, didn't get the job yet, was in the middle of the final interview. They happened to go look at his Facebook page and they said, gosh, our clients would not like what you have on your Facebook profile, therefore you cannot be at our firm. And they did not make the offer, even though it seemed like a shoe in so I kid you not, when you're thinking about what you want to share, whatever age you are, there can be consequences. Fired. And think about that, all your hard work to get from like over there to over here, and one tweet, one Facebook post, one whatever, could like move your, undo all your work. You could maybe not even get a job in the career or path you want. So I share that just to be mindful. Think about the know, like, and trust. If you're gonna put something, if it's not nice, if you're in doubt, leave it out. That's my quote for you. Again, I'm not here to tell you if it's right or wrong. Decide what's right for you. If you wanna be provocative, great, but that has consequences. And when people respond to you and they're not nice to you, you kinda of threw that out there. So then you also have to be mindful not to be not nice back. So you have to plan some scenario planning, okay. Because I do this all the time. I'll write something and I'll be like, okay, well, this person would definitely like it. And it's a wonderful LinkedIn blog. But what about these people? And so as long as you're okay with that, if those people don't like it, and maybe it's not your job to get everybody to like you because that's a hard thing, just be mindful. So what I would ask you to do as you're thinking about LinkedIn, because it is professional, it is the boardroom, it is important that you are yourself, but understand it's also within a certain context. You do want to provoke thought. You do want to have a voice. But be mindful of the story you're telling. Be mindful of how others might perceive it. And just be intentional. So thank you so much for your time. I appreciate it. Thank you, Jen. Our third speaker today is Ilana Golan. Ilana is a serial entrepreneur international keynote speaker and tech investor in the Silicon Valley. She was selected as top 40 women to watch in 2016 and Silicon Valley Women of Influence in 2017. Ilana, welcome. Thank you. So when I was 18, this was my life. I was living and breathing F-16 fighter jets in the Israel Air Force. I was an F-16 flight instructor, super motivated to prove to everyone that I can do this just as good as men. But back in the days, women were not allowed to become commanders, essentially telling me that I can't be as good as them. That was hard for me to accept. So I worked really, really hard to prove myself, but breaking barriers is super rough. You're constantly out of your comfort zone, and you really don't have a lot of examples and role models to look at. So let me share one of my pivotal stories. It was a Tuesday night. I was about to go to bed when the emergency phone rang. Ilana needs to come to the flight tower quick. 
Hmm, I wonder what that's all about. That never happened before. But I rushed over. That's not a real photo from that then, but um, it was a very dark room. But instead of one or two people, there were 12 with gloomy faces. What's up, guys? I'll refrain from saying real names, so let's call him um, Paul that was holding the communication radio talking to James, the pilot. And Paul turned to me and said, Ilana, James up there has a really bad hydraulic problem. We don't know if he can land. Still not quite sure what I got myself into and quite excited and honored that they called for me. I took the communication radio and said, hey, James, let's see what you've got there. But James said one thing and one that I will never forget. James said, Ilana, I absolutely must see my family again, and you need to bring me down alive. Whoa. I didn't expect that. And it just started to sink in that every decision that I'm about to make may be a life and death decision. I'm not ready for this. I'm not even 20. How can I take this kind of responsibility? What if I make a mistake? I was scared. I was really, really scared. But I was the one training them, and part of the training were emergencies, so I guess I have to own this? So I did, and, and I told James, hey, James, um, let's run some experiments. Now, pilots have a very clear checklist of what to do in cases of emergency. And if you think about it, these checklists are actually a list of experiments. You, you reset one system, you check what happens. You reset another system, you see what happens, right? Now, usually, or sometimes, this solves the problem. And I'm sure James have tried it many times before they called for me. But when it doesn't, it actually gives you data. Now, just like in real life and in business, you're never going to feel like you have all the information you want to make the ultimate decision. But you'll collect all the information you can to make the best decision possible based on current conditions. And if you need, you'll change it. So it was decision time. Jim can either go eject in the sea, throwing a $20 million of a plane to the sea and risking his life, or he can try to land. He won't have brakes. He's not a good way to stop the plane. And if he catches fire, he's doomed. Darn it. Um, it was decision time. I was sweating. I was scared as hell. But, you know, it's like, okay, James, let's get you down here. Give me a few minutes to get the ground crew ready. And with a phenomenal teamwork, James landed safely. Now, what I learned that day were countless of lessons that I'm taking with me for the rest of my life. So let's talk about a mission, first of all. See, for me, a mission was a bunch of fancy words. I never really thought much about it. But see, a mission is so much. Suddenly, I realized I'm not just training F-16 pilots. I'm training them to defend my country and come home safe. And if my training is not doing that, then I need to change it. Now, suddenly, when you understand your mission, everything becomes clear. You wake up in the morning, and you understand the goal, the goal for the day, the goal for the week, the goal for the month. Everything becomes clear. But you also need to own it. You need to take responsibility and you need to say, OK, I'm going to do this, and I'm going to make this happen. And I'm going to make it happen together with a phenomenal team. And team is key. And team is not just your colleagues or direct reports. Your team is an entire ecosystem. See, James landed safely due to a phenomenal collaboration between maintenance, ground emergency control, firefighters, and more. These are the ecosystem. So who is your ecosystem? Who are the teams that will own it and will create the mission with you? Now, what was interesting for me is that from that point on, I started leading by experiments, basically leaning forward and experimenting. And the very first experiment that we started doing is how can we do better training? How can it be more personalized? How can it be closer to the real thing? And we completely changed the training and education for the pilots um, in Israel 
And I became the first woman to ever become a commander in charge of training of all F-16 pilots um, in Israel. Thank you. In the simulator. Thank you. But, ex thank you. And experimentation didn't stop there. So the basic of experimentation, just to make sure we're all aligned, and many will say it's basically build, measure, learn. So you have a problem or you have some assumption. You make some kind of a test or you build something just to see if it's, it makes sense. And you understand if you solve the problem. And then you iterate and you take your findings and you create another lesson, right? I would argue that you actually don't need to build much. You can just do something. You test. And this is the art of experimentation. See, the art of experimentation is what is the absolute minimum that you need to do to prove, negate, or change an assumption. So here's a story. In 2010, I landed in San Francisco with my husband, two kids, and I was excited. We're going to start quality systems in the US. I will sell automation to the biggest customers in the world. My team in Israel thought this is the best thing since sliced bread. So obviously, I'm just here to collect the money. It never really works that way, does it? No. Um, so <laughs> I reach high. I figured Cisco HP, they'll be phenomenal customers for me. And I build great relationships just like they taught me. Um, but after a few lunches, dinners, I realized they're not going to buy my product. My product is adding absolutely no value to them. But how come? In Israel, I heard it's amazing. What, what do I do now? And I go back home, and I, and I have to tell you that these are probably the hardest weeks of my life. Like, I just left my family, and here I am failing completely. Now, I, I, and I wake up in the, at night, in the middle of the night, and, and I, I sweat, and I cry, and I don't know what I'm going to do, because I'm going to need to fire a lot of people now. And it's because of me. I'm letting everybody down, myself, my family, my company. So I had to go back to these customers, and I had to figure out what is it that I'm missing? So this time I came not with a pitch and not with a selling point. But actually, like we say to sales, you have two ears, one mouth, shut up and listen. That's how I went. So this time, I just came with a bunch of questions. What keeps you up at night? What takes your weekends away? What frustrates you when you come in the morning and suddenly when you listen, you actually hear answers? Shocking. But then I realized what their, their pain is. And I could create a little vision. See, my do was not a minimum viable product. It wasn't a product. It definitely wasn't a viable of anything. It was just a little bit of a vision with a very specific story aligned with what they need, with their language, with what, how it's going to work for them when they come in the morning. And with that vision, I would iterate, and I would, I would hear their feedback, and I would try again, and I would try again. And that experimentation, when it's so close to the customer, it's so much more accurate. And we pivoted the company. So we decided that this is the right thing. We pivoted the company and changed direction. And from a, a scenario where I look at the board and try to figure out how on earth I'm going to bring 200K in, a year later, we're at 2.5 million. A couple of years later, it's 15 million yearly revenue we were taking off. Um, experimentation saved this company. But it's not only saved the company. It also, we kept on leading by experimentation to find new markets, new audiences, new customer, new message, new features. It's all experimentation. And the beauty of this is experimentation is not just for business and definitely not just for F-16. It's everywhere in life. And if you look around you, you'll see hundreds of people, millions of people reinventing their careers. And more and more people will start reinventing their career. Gone are the days when people are stuck in the same place for 40 years. So how do they find the next big thing? How do they find what they want to do? Guess what? It's experimentation. And we have all the tools for it. Jen talked about it. We have it all. We, if we want to be independent, great. Let's create a little website. Let's see what it does. Let's see if we like the branding. Let's see if people at, you know, attach to it. We want to sell some, great. Create a little Facebook ad. Let's see if people engage. Oh, you want, you're not sure about message, great. Create 10. 
Let's see what happens. A blog? Let's see subscribers? So we have all the tools. We can even volunteer and do some work in our spare time and see if this is what we want to do. These are all experiments. So let me leave with, uh, with you something small and for you to think about what is really your mission. Where do you want to be in a year, in two years? And what is the actually minimum that you need to make to get there faster, cheaper, safer, happier? What experiments will you start today? Thank you and good luck for the next speech. Thank you, Ilana. Our final speaker today is Chloe Valdry. She is the brand ambassador at Jerusalem U, a film production company and Israel Education Center based in Jerusalem. Please join me in welcoming Chloe. Hello, everyone. How's everyone doing today? Awesome. How's everyone doing today? You guys excited? <laughs> So, so, so I'm Chloe Valdery. It's a pleasure to be with you all today. And um, my job is basically to get my generation to fall in love with Israelis. <laughs> that, that is literally my job. Uh, I have been in the space of Israel engagement for six years and counting. And um, I have experimented with and refined my philosophy on how to do this. And now I work for a film production company uh, called Jerusalem U, based in Jerusalem, that produces documentaries and digital shorts that is really all about branding Israel and making Israel cool for young people. So I'm going to show you first a video that we recently produced, a little background. Uh, I was in South Africa in March for a two-week speaking tour. It was my first time in South Africa, and I was touring the Jewish community and also uh, the native communities, and I really wanted to capture my first time being there and the synergy uh, between the people of Israel and the people of South Africa, and this is what we came up with. I learned a lot of things in my various travels and lectures and talks, but being in South Africa and having already gone to Israel, I learned that to have a motherland is to belong to something. It is to feel safe and secure and whole. And there's a natural synergy between places that are homelands to indigenous peoples. I feel fortunate that the work I do has taken me to Africa and Israel. And I felt the same maternal familiarity in both. It's almost like a rhythm that resonates in both places. I think both of these places speak the same language of courage and strength. It's especially powerful when you consider that both people struggled to establish these places in the face of abuse and persecution. Both black South Africans and the Jews of Europe, the Middle East, and North Africa were fighting to survive in the face of oppression and bigotry. They were fighting for not only physical freedom, but really trying to prove to the world and to themselves that they mattered. They were fighting for significance and purpose. They were fighting to affirm that identity matters, that history matters in crafting and shaping how we see and define ourselves, that attachment to a place matters, that self-empowerment matters, that love of oneself matters. And that's one of the most beautiful things we can ever encounter as human beings. And that's what I learned in both South Africa and Israel. So that was a super fun uh, digital short that we got to, to create. Um, I'm going to tell you my story and how I got involved in the Israel space because it has a lot to do with how I came to conclusions about branding. So I am not Jewish, and I am not Israeli. Uh, <laughs> I was born and raised in New Orleans, Louisiana. Grew up in a very 
uh, atypical Christian family that was steeped in Jewish culture. As a Christian, I grew up observing Shabbat and keeping kosher style and keeping all the holy days, which is as weird as it sounds and what you're probably thinking right now. I'll give you just a quick story about how that, how that works. In Judaism, you have a rabbinical text, right? And it tells you, you know, how to, let's say, keep Sukkot. So for Sukkot, you build a sukkah outside your house, and you, like, pray in it and study Kohelet or whatever. My parents did not have the rabbinical text. So they were like, we're just going to interpret this however we want to interpret it. So where it says to stay in a temporary dwelling place, we're going to stay in Florida. And we're going to stay in condos, because that is a temporary dwelling place. So this past Sukkot, my parents were in Florida staying in condos for that holiday. Uh, so as you can imagine, I fell in love with Jewish customs. I fell in love with Jewish culture, read Jewish literature all throughout high school, uh, began to read all of Elie Wiesel, freshman year in college, majored in film. I have a film background, uh, freshman year, but then switched majors to international studies because anti-Semitism was rising globally. There was a lot of talk about anti-Semitism, especially in places like France. And I wanted my generation to be the generation that stemmed the tide, the rising tide of anti-Semitism. So I switched majors, started a student pro-Israel organization called Allies of Israel at the University of New Orleans, where I did Israel advocacy for three and a half years. Now, the big question, right, the why, so to speak, that we were asking was initially, how do we stop anti-Semitism? But that question soon changed to, how do we get people to fall in love with Israelis? And these are two very different questions. The first question essentially is all about, how do you get people to stop hating? But the second question, which is much more powerful, is fundamentally about how do you get people to start loving? And it was that second question that began to excite the minds and hearts of both Jews and non-Jews in my communities in regards to the Israel conversation. So we began to build events on campus around this fundamental question, how do you get people to start loving? And it was a very successful thing to do. I graduated two years ago. Uh, from the University of New Orleans in 2015, became a Tikva fellow at the Wall Street Journal, where I worked with Brett Stevens and developed a paper entitled Israel and Millennial Engagement, What Works, What Doesn't, and How to Make It Better. And the summation of this paper, or the conclusion of this paper, was really achieved by studying branding. So by this time, I had moved to New York from New Orleans, and I was obsessed with the question of why people were so obsessed with Times Square. Because Times Square is actually not that big of a deal, guys. It's, it's bright lights, right? It's big pictures. And people go and they're like, oh my god, I can't. This is, every, this is everything. So I was, I was perplexed by this question. Why are we, as human beings, gravitating toward Times Square. And then I began to ask other questions. Why do we as human beings, including yours truly, obsess over Beyonce? Like, what is it about Beyonce that compels our attention? So I started doing two things. I surveyed the landscape of pro-Israel organizations that currently exist. And the second thing I did was I started to study branding. I studied Guy Nawasaki's book, Enchantment. I got Nagasaki being the former marketing director of Apple. I studied power branding by Steve McKee. I studied Coca-Cola and Starbucks and Nike. And the conclusion that I came to is what I like to call the theory of enchantment. Now, in order to explain to you what the theory of enchantment is, I'm going to tell you what it is not first, OK? This is the opposite of the theory of enchantment. And it is called the cherry tomato complex. That is knowing laughter for all of you who are laughing. So the way pro-Israel advocacy is done today goes something like this. Hello, random student on campus going about your merrily day. I just want to tell you about this random country that you know nothing about. 
And uh, I think you should just love this country. It's called Israel. And do you know why you should love this country? You should love this country because Israelis invented the cherry tomato. <laughs> and do you know what she's going to do? She's going to say, bye. I have to go to class. So that's the cherry tomato complex. And that's the way in which Israel advocacy, a lot of it is done today. So the theory of enchantment essentially says that we have to create content in which our audience sees themselves and their potential reflected in the content. Let me say that again. The theory of enchantment is the process by, we, by which we create content in which our audience can see themselves and their potential reflected in the content. This is what Nike does, just do it, right? This is what Coca-Cola does when it places happiness at the center of its brand. So that means if you're a student, I'm going to come to you and to really sum it up, I'm going to be like, did you know that Israelis built something out of nothing and therefore you can do it too? <laughs> so now you're at the center of the brand. <laughs> that is the difference. That is the difference. So, so now, uh, in my current work, I am a brand ambassador for Jerusalem U. This is what we do. We create epic, compelling films, digital shorts for social media, Facebook, Instagram, Snapchat, etc., all for the purpose of connecting young people to Israel. I've produced videos in which I, I can connect, you know, Drake and Nike to Israel, and people are really into that. Um, I, I had, I've done a video where, I don't know, if, I'm sure you guys are familiar with Rennie Greenspan, the Israeli personality. I've done a video with her where we did a 24-hour epic adventure in Israel. Um, it's on our YouTube. So this is what I'm really all about, connecting pop culture and using pop culture as a vehicle to connect young millennials, my generation, to Israel and to fall in love with the Israeli people. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Chloe. I'm going to invite the three panelists to come join me on stage for Q&A. Anybody who has a question, um, please line up behind the microphones. We're going to leave it for questions and not statements. Um, I invite you to talk to the panelists regarding statements after uh, the panel is over. Yes, thank you. <laughs> Questions? If anybody wants. Do you mind coming up to the microphone over here? <clears throat> Congratulations Thank to you. all of you. Kolakabod, we say in Hebrew. And um, I was born in Israel, made in Israel. I have four boys. The young one, you know, he's a mom, talking about loving the Israelis. There is a way to do peace with the Arabs. How? He said, you know, we are Israeli. We are so intelligent. We are so good in the media. We are so good in film. Hollywood is full of Jewish people. Why don't we do kind of uh, brainwashing to the Arabs. I mean, show, even it's, it's like imagination, show how peace look like to do a series of that uh, the young boy from an Arab, I mean, how he succeeds to, to be a, a doctor in Israel. He, he lives in a beautiful home, uh, he has beautiful children, and, and you know, etc., etc., etc. Show really how it beautiful is if we had peace, if we could go to eat hummus in, in, in Damascus on in, in Saturday, I mean, how we could make business with them, how it looks like. I mean, nothing to do with the reality something total imagination, and brainstorming them. <laughs> I said, well, it's a good idea, right? It's a good idea.
Small kid, great idea. Just for you, is a challenge. So first of all, I want to say thank you for raising this. I think it's a very important point. I want to say that as somebody is dealing with business and now in Silicon Valley, um, I think I'm, I'm actually very hopeful because what I'm hearing from the business world is that the business world is bridging things that we could never bridge before. And I'm not saying that it's going to solve all the problems and we won't get there, but, but the business kind of talk is already bridging some very, very interesting bridges. And you know, just last week I had a meeting with the Kuwait investment and another day I had you know, meeting with Egyptian and Lebanon. And what's amazing about it is when you talk about business, there are no boundaries. And actually, if anything, Arabs right now are very looking up to Israel as innovation. And that is very intriguing. So I think if, if, if something can actually change it, it is the business world. And you know, kind of off the record, there is something happening with, with an international peace accelerator. And you know, I'm hopeful that that can take I understood him well what he meant, the medium that we have and we dominate which is the, the movies and the creation and the creativity. I mean, to show something right. imaginary, to show it, you know, to, to transmit it to Gaza, to the small uh, places that in Jordan, in, in Syria, in, in, in Egypt, in, in everywhere. Look how it can be done. Stop killing each other. I agree. Thank you. Next question. Hi. Great. Hi, ladies. Uh, thank you very much for all of your presentations. I think my question is aimed uh, mainly at Chloe and Jen. Um, so when you consider a connection between personal branding and professional branding, if you're trying to be an advocate for anything, um, especially anything as in many cases as controversial as Israel support, um, a lot of times if you're not within just your own ideological bubble, you'll get hit with controversy. So whether you're dealing with LinkedIn, Facebook, Twitter, personal conversations, um, in school, out of school, at work, how do you deal with either mitigating the controversial and sometimes radically disruptively bad um, topics that come up, um, or how do you make it into a constructive conversation? How do you edge that on uh, personal conversations uh, that happen in media, and how do you do that in a professional context? Thank you. Can share, I can share the personal side briefly, um, and I think Chloe and I are very aligned on, on how to approach this. If you're over here and your audience is over here, it's very important that you're not starting where you are, that you have to meet them where they are. And sometimes that means the conversation you're starting isn't the one you want to start, but it's the one you need to plant to grow. And so I think if you're gonna start a controversial one, or it could be, run it by a few people first. Get feedback and try to incorporate the other person's perspective. Because if you're starting from a place where they don't agree with you already, you're never gonna have that discussion. But if you can start with, well, where are they at? Empathy, understanding where they're coming from and begin there speaking to the heart, not the mind. Facts never work when you're trying to convince someone because people are like, this is my belief, I'm not moving. But if you can get to the heart of the matter, you can start to move them that way. Um, but it does mean planning, doing scenario planning. I try to be very um, innocuous, but have responses ready. And, and if I need to walk away from the computer, I do so. I don't just respond out of anger. I try to get to the right place before I respond. Yeah. Or a feed of I will let people know on my personal feed that I will remove you if you're going to be negative, and I will set those boundaries. LinkedIn's a little bit trickier because it's a professional network, so I try not to push that conversation. But everyone is fair game. CEOs, doesn't matter. They're going to say something that people are going to be negative about, and so people who post the mean stuff, they need to be careful. That will have consequences. It may be out of your hands to deal with, but at least on the personal side, set boundaries. Yeah, I think setting boundaries is, is very important. Uh, and w when I started out in the Israel space, the language I was using was much more politicized 
because that was the only language and vocabulary I was familiar with. But over time, I've noticed as I've gotten away from political language and used more uh, humanizing language, um, as well as having the objective of not am I trying to get this person to agree with me, but I'm trying to foster compassion in this particular framework, even as we profoundly disagree with each other. And I, f I found that the more I set that as my goal, the more like-minded people I attract anyway. Uh, on social media and in interpersonal communications. We have microphones on both sides. The microphone is right over here. Thank you. I was wondering if Chloe has any uh, possibility for her to be involved with the colleges with uh, some of the students with Hillel and other colleges because you would um, most likely be a wonderful ad advocate that they will listen to you. Uh, we've heard so much here in, at the conference and in the past few years, uh, the negative feeling toward Israel. And uh, you know, would you consider that? Yes, yeah, so I've toured uh, on many college campuses across America, as well as in many Jewish day schools. Um, and we're building a couple of new projects right now that we want to get out to the Hillels and to all of our partners um, that they can use to foster these compassionate conversations on campus. Um, to be quite honest with you, we're also, I think, really trying to pioneer a new way of, we don't even like to call it Israel advocacy because it sets a sort of us versus them binary. We, we like to call it Israel education or Israel engagement. Um, so we're working on a few projects that we're trying to get out to our partners. But to answer your question, I have been on the college campus. I mean, I'll just give you one quick uh, example of the theory of enchantment working. Uh, we toured with our film, Maconan, Journey of an African Jew, last, last fall. And this film is about an Israeli Ethiopian soldier uh, in the IDF. And we toured with a band called Café Shokor Kazak. Uh, on many different campuses, yes, we did. Uh, and it was incredible, we had, a, we had an average of 200, 250 students come out and celebrate on these campuses. Um, and in many cases, the African student unions and the African American student unions actually reached out to the Jewish student unions to partner because they saw themselves and their potential reflected in the content that we were putting out. So we, do, we are on college campuses and we will be expanding that program. We need more Chloe's like you. <laughs> Hi, uh, my question is also for Chloe. Okay. Uh, about the uh, video, about the comparison with yeah. South Africa. I thought that was a very bold move. Thank you. Uh, Deliberately so. Usually yes. the comparison is on a long different lines. Yes. So I'm just wondering where the idea came from. And, um, so, yes, yeah, so uh, the Federation in South Africa invited me to be the keynote speaker for their annual conference. And I knew that there was a lot of, you know, controversy around South Africa and Israel. Um, but I started to read some of the works of the anti-apartheid uh, activists from, from way in the past, specifically Steve Biko. I, wrote a, I read a collection of his writings uh, to prepare myself for my trip to South Africa. And I couldn't help but think that there was a, that there was a topic that wasn't explored uh, in this entire debate by neither the pro-Israel community nor the anti-Israel community. And that topic was the fact that both Jews and specifically Ashkenazi Jews um, and black South Africans had his historically experienced oppression coming from Europe. And both peoples uh, developed uh, liberation movements in response to those sources of oppression. And no one had ever explored the parallels uh, between those two communities. Um, and so I wanted to really do something that captured that parallel, uh, which transcended the, the binary conversation that is going on right now, and the, quite frankly, the pettiness um, rooted in the conversation. And listen, I've met with um, you know, many black South Africans who experienced apartheid and who are themselves pro-Israel advocates in South Africa. So my trip was very eye-opening, and I just wanted to shift the paradigm and to shift the, the context in which that conversation was being had. All right, 
Uh, no more questions for now. We're done for today. Thank you, ladies, so much. Um, everyone's around the rest of the day. If you have questions, feel free to approach them. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.